Welcome back to Social Psychology 150A. Um, today, we're going to resume our lecture on stereotypes. OK. So now, let's, uh, let's talk about stereotypes. Where were we? Well, we were embarking on this uh, amazing intellectual journey. Uh, all of you were extraordinarily excited. Uh, and, and you were having a great time. We were all learning a lot about social psychology. And uh, substantively, we were learning about stereotypes. Uh, we were learning that they have negative as well as positive content. Um, we talked about where they come from, both personal experience and from social sources, like media or peers or, or uh, parents. And uh, we talked about some of the drawbacks uh, of stereotypes, ways in which they can be wrong, ways in which they can be right. And then, after all that, we began to talk about a little bit, uh, we talked about some research related to stereotypes. We talked about two studies on stereotypes, one, which talked about the motivated nature of stereotyping. Uh, it's the case that when you're motivated to uh, explain away, say, a bad grade you get in a class or something like that, you're more likely to activate a negative stereotype that can help you uh, come to grips with that negative experience. So for example, if a female instructor gives you a bad grade in a class, you're more likely to activate a stereotype of female instructors are unqualified and incompetent. Um, but you don't have that available stereotype to activate for men in this culture, and so you don't do it for men, even if they give you a bad grade, or you do it less so. Um, what movie is this from? That's exactly right. <laughs> okay. Uh, study two that we talked about was a study called The Police Officer's Dilemma, where these researchers were motivated to try to understand uh, why it is that African Americans are disproportionately the victims of accidental police shootings, or you might say accidental police shootings. And they had this uh, theory that it had something to do with stereotypes, with automatic stereotype activation. And in particular, their idea was that police officers, in the course of their job, have to every day, or maybe not every day, but very often, make split-second judgments of whether a target is threatening or not, much like the judgments you have to make in these video games where you're shooting either hostages or criminals or something like that. Um, and so they said, well, we'll design a video game to test this idea. And in this video game, we'll present people with pictures of white and black targets who either are criminal or are not criminal, and then see if people screw up more often and uh, indicate that they want to shoot an African-American person who's innocent, um, and also uh, if they maybe do that faster, if they maybe shoot African-American targets faster than white targets. And their reasoning is that in that split second when you see the target, you're trying to figure out if they have a weapon or if they're maybe holding something else in their hand or something. Uh, one thing you rely on is stereotypic, automatic stereotype activations, assumptions that you make about the traits of the target based purely on, in this case, the color of their skin. And because part of the stereotype of African Americans is that they're threatening or hostile, or African American males at least, they're threatening and hostile, uh, if you see an African American male, you'll think threatening and hostile, and you'll be more likely to guess very quickly that they are carrying a weapon. And they confirmed this uh, in a series of studies showing that uh, African Americans in this, in this kind of video game setup were disproportionately the victims of false positives, where people would falsely say, oh, they're, they're an aggressor, they're a, they're a criminal, uh, they're holding a gun, when in fact they weren't. And then one of the big criticisms of this research was, oh, well, they tested this idea that they had on undergraduates, who are nothing like the people who are actually on the streets having to make this decision. The people on the streets having to make this decision, or these decisions, are trained for, to make decisions in exactly these kinds of scenarios. And so they're going to be very accurate, and they're not going to make these kinds of mistakes. Uh, so you found just another demonstration of stereotype effects amongst undergraduates, but not one which applies to the phenomenon you be, you're, you're claiming to explain and study. So then they replicated this research uh, using a sample of actual police officers, they did the study again and they found the same findings, uh, which is strong evidence that the original research did apply uh, to police officers in the street making these sorts of decisions. Are there questions about this research or any of the last lecture? Okay, bless you. Okay, so stereotype research study three. Here we're just sort of uh, we're just sort of dancing through the meadow of stereotype research. We're just kind of gallivanting around, having a wonderful time. You can imagine us all just skipping and playing in the sun, uh, reviewing research on stereotypes. And so this isn't particularly related to the last one. Um, 
this is on, we're going to talk about now, we're going to talk now about stereotype threat research, which is a very different phenomenon in some ways, though it's also based on non-consciously held stereotypes, uh, generalizations you hold about people. Uh, they can often have a lot of negative content for socially stigmatized groups. Uh, so who here is familiar with stereotype threat research from earlier classes they've taken or something like that? Okay. So, um, so stereotype threat research is basically the following idea. It's an idea espoused by Claude Steele, who's a psychology professor at, you guessed it, Stanford University. Oh, oh I know. And Claude Steele, again, triumphing over his professional background to do very good research, has this, this idea that people perform worse on tests when negative stereotypes that apply to them are made active in their minds. And the problem he's trying to explain here is why is it that there's a testing gap for women in math and science domains relative to men? Why is it that women uh, tend to perform worse in uh, certain math and science tests relative to men? And uh, why is it that African Americans perform worse on, say, the SAT uh, than whites in America, or uh, same with Latinos? And his explanation is maybe it's the case that negative stereotypes about uh, these the members of these groups' uh, performance on these tests become active and then somehow inhibit their performance on these tests. Now, this should seem like a somewhat similar, uh, familiar idea because we reviewed some very similar research earlier in the semester. Can anybody identify what that research was? We talked about the bell curve, exactly. And then we talked about some research that was responding to the bell curve. <laughs> Lavalia et al., 1998, exactly. So Lavalia et al., 1998, had this idea that it's status, right? That if you're a low status group in some setting, uh, then you're going to perform worse on a test uh, just as a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy. Because you're expected to perform worse, you do before, perform worse. That social expectations, the power of the situation, if you will, uh, directs your actual performance. Well, Claude Steele has a very similar idea with stereotype threat research. He also thinks that if you have some kind of negative stigma that's made salient in some situation, that you're reminded of social perceptions of you uh, that are negative because you fall in, into some category, that, yeah, you're going to perform worse. But I'd say stereotype threat research is maybe just a little bit more specific about how that works. And so we'll talk about the mechanisms that uh, stereotype threat researchers have advanced for uh, what's going on. Why did you do that? <laughs> Okay, okay, that's better. This is terrific. Okay. So, Claude Steele had this idea that if African Americans are made aware of their race prior to taking a test, it would lead to worse performance, uh, but that this would not be the case for whites or Asian Americans. Uh, and he had the same idea for women taking math tests. There's this uh, negative stereotype about women's performance in math and science domains. If that's made salient, then women will perform worse on a math test or a science test than they would otherwise, um, even controlling for their actual abilities in the area. Uh, so again, Lavalia says this is a self-fulfilling prophecy uh, where low expectations uh, lead to low achievement, um, and Steele wants to push this a little bit further and sort of say, well, okay, self-fulfilling prophecy, but let's really get into the nitty-gritty here and explain this. Perhaps, perhaps it's the case that negative stereotypes become active in your mind uh, in a testing situation, and the reason that they impede performance is because they reduce working memory capacity. And working memory capacity is basically your ability to focus attention on some task while keeping other thoughts at bay or at, at a minimum. So it's essentially your ability to focus, right? And if you've ever taken the SAT or the GRE or one of these standardized tests in a situation where you're bothered by other thoughts, other things are on your mind, distractors in your testing environment or what have you, you know that if you are trying to hold other thoughts at bay, in a testing situation, uh, it can hurt your performance, or it feels like it's going to hurt your performance, right? Um, like when you're bothered by some sort of issues in your personal life, or uh, maybe the person next to you is really distracting, what have you, you're going to probably perform worse on that standardized test, because any decent standardized test is going to be reasonably taxing to your, to your mental abilities, right? Um, even if it wasn't, even if you knew all the questions, they put a time limit on it just to make sure that you are stressed out and freaked out. Um, it's clever how they do that. So perhaps, and this is, this is an idea that Claude Steele had, but also I think you should, 
good to attribute it to Schmader and Johns, who do this research we're about to review on it. Uh, perhaps it's the case of stereotype activation makes for diverted attention, keeping a part of your mind busy worrying about or thinking about the stereotype that's been made active and low expectations associated with it. So you uh, are reminded, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm taking a math test. Everybody says we're bad at this, I guess I'm supposed to perform badly. And you might not endorse that thought, you might still have self-confidence in the face of it, and so on. But at the same time, uh, it is distracting and you're having to try to hold that at bay while you do uh, the, uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing wrong with the technical stuff, I think everything's fine. Okay, all right, so. Schmader and Johns went to go test this idea and, uh, in 2003, and this is the way they tested this idea, trying to see if stereotype activation would reduce working memory capacity. So obviously, the first step, what would you do if you're going to manipulate the independent variable, which is stereotypes being salient? That's what they did. They activated a stereotype. They presented subjects with a test that was either presented as a working memory capacity test, uh, which I think it, it was, or they presented it as a quantitative test that women have scored poorly on in the past. So activating a salient negative stereotype that women perform poorly on this test, okay? And past stereotype threat research has showed that generally women will perform worse on a math test if they're reminded women perform poorly on math tests. Uh, but in this case, they're using a working memory capacity test. It's more of a test, uh, well, here's how the test worked. The test had people memorize a series of words, then do math problems, and then list those memorized words. Uh, so the test is all about, can you hold a bunch of words in your head while you work on some other task, and then report those words as accurately as possible at the end? Does this test uh, make sense? OK. Uh, and so they studied people's ability to perform well on this test. And as you would expect, uh, or as they predicted, female participants did score worse on this me wor uh, working memory capacity test when it was presented as a quantitative test that women are, are bad at. Uh, but normally, uh, women actually did a little bit better than men on this test because uh, they're really smart. OK. So. Oh, no. What's happened? Oh, maybe. <laughs> yes, I am. Oh, yeah? Here, here oh, shit. Go. Wow. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, All right. Uh, let's give it up. Give it up. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Well, Professor Willer, uh, after a long and tedious process of going through more than 100 nominations to the 2009 Golden Apple, you could take a bite after me. Um, uh, just want to congratulate you. Uh, the Golden Apple is the only student conferred award on this campus, uh, nominated by students, given by students, organized by students. And uh, Noah Stern and I, uh, my name is Sammy Averbeck, uh, as, uh, yeah, we emailed. All he knew was that he was a finalist, but um, that's why we wanted to make sure we got the blush effect. Anyway, uh, we're thrilled to give you the 2009 award, and uh, assuming you're willing to accept it, which you already did, um, you will be speaking to a crowd at least this full, hopefully, with all of these people present on April 29th at 7 p.m., where you will be delivering the first Golden Apple Initiative, where you'll be challenging the students to do something better for this campus, for this community, because they entrust you to... Uh, to, uh, to do so, um, the nominations praised your ability to inspire, to show care, uh, and, and we're really honored to give it to such a young and energetic guy like you. <laughs> and, <laughs> wait, uh, and, and Hans, and okay, so uh, congratulations. <laughs> That's what most of the nominations were like, what a pleasure to look at. Anyway, <laughs> before I get off track. Oh, man. Sorry to interrupt, and um, give him up one more time for the 2009 Golden Apple Award, Rob Buller. Thanks, man. Wow, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, Sammy. I, it's the last thing I expected to happen. I thought, I thought it was one of those prank things, the, uh, the thing where they come by and prank you in your, uh, in your class. Uh, man, that's amazing. Thanks a lot. That's, uh, it's totally flattering, and I'll do my best to live up to it. Uh, try and give a great lecture for you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. I don't know if any of you had anything to do with this, but uh, that's totally, totally flattering and surprising. Yes. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, that'd be wonderful. Yeah, make yourself at home. <laughs> wow. Whew. Man, I am completely embarrassed now. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. Um. 
uh, I'm speechless for the first time in my teaching career. Uh, man, that's totally flattering. So they had convinced me that they were gonna that I was a, that I was nominated and that they were gonna come by for like some in-depth uh, grilling interview. Uh, that made this especially surprising. Um, so thanks thanks a lot for for listening to me uh, teaching this semester. I appreciate it. Um, it takes two to tango. So. Uh, Okay, uh, back to the relentless negative effects of stereotypes and stigmas in uh, society and everyday interaction. Uh, uh, okay, all right. So um, I was wondering what was going on with the technical stuff. That was a very clever. I was like, "There's nothing wrong technically. There's nothing." Okay, so that's they changed the lighting. So we'll we'll move the lighting back if that's okay. Unless there's some reason we. Okay, we'll move the lighting back. Great. Okay. Um, Back to social psychology. So uh, the results of that study, I, I'm totally embarrassed. Uh, <laughs> the results of this study were that uh, female participants scored worse on the working memory capacity test. Uh, uh, but then normally, if a negative stereotype about women, women's performance in math and science domains was not made salient, the women would actually score higher. And then the dude walked in, and I, and I got flustered. Uh, so then they conducted a follow-up study because they wanted to say this isn't just about gender. This isn't just about women in uh, math and science domains. It's general to any domain where a negative stigma or stereotype could be made salient in that domain and then impede performance. So what they did was they replicated the study using white and Latino participants. Uh, this is at University of Arizona. And they, uh, in one condition, they just gave participants a test. Um, and in another, with well, the same test, the working memory capacity test, in another condition, they told participants the test was diagnostic of intelligence and would be used to assess uh, different groups of people. Uh, so it's this kind of very vague, sort of subtle suggestion uh, that, that, that somehow this test is going to be used to assess, like, you know, how smart are Latinos versus whites and whatnot. And uh, so this is very, very subtle. Oh, and they're also asked to report their ethnicity. So they have to report their ethnicity, they're reminded of their ethnicity, and then they're told, we're going to use this test to like, find out you know, how smart different groups are. So kind of you know, whether the whites or the Latinos are going to score higher. This is very subtle, right? This is very subtle. It's not saying Latinos score worse on this test. It's just saying, hmm, what's your ethnicity? Hmm, you know? And then we're going to try and assess you know, your group, whatever group that is, against these other groups. So the results, as you might guess, uh, because that is a stigma, or that does feel like a subtle activation of a stigma, is that Latinos scored worse on the test when it was presented as diagnostic of intelligence, asked to report their ethnicity, and told that it'll be used to discriminate between groups. Um, though normally, Latinos did a little bit better than whites did on the test. Um, again, because they're really smart people. So Latinos reported more anxiety and perceived the test as harder in the threatened condition. So uh, when Latinos were told, like, put, when the pressure was put on them, they were like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the anxiety you're trying to create, and this feels like a harder test. And of course, the test was a test of working memory capacity, and they performed worse on it. So all of this is kind of giving us this sense of what's the mechanism? What's the underlying mechanism that drives uh, these effects? And what it seems to be in this research is uh, that work is this working memory capacity thing, but it's also you kind of get this cluster of emotional reactions too. That they're feeling anxious, they perceive the test is harder, they're distracted, trying to keep these stereotypic thoughts at bay, which is reducing their working memory capacity, which is the kind of thing that would be very useful to have on a test of this sort. And then finally, they conducted a final study, Schmader and Johns, 2003 did, and in this final study they showed that the effective stereotype threat of making salient some stigma and its negative effects on your subsequent performance, that it's statistically mediated by reduced working memory capacity. Now what the heck is Rob talking about? Statistically mediated. I haven't warned you about this term, I don't think. Have I talked about mediation? Not really. Okay. So, Mediation, when a variable mediates some relationship between other var variables, it means that it is an intervening variable which drives the effect. So when I say that working memory capacity mediates the effect of stereotype threat on test performance, what I'm saying is stereotype threat, per uh, stereotype threat effects on test performance operate through working memory capacity. It is the uh, intervening variable. In other words, there isn't a direct effect of stereotype threat salience on performing poorly on tests. The effect is stereotype threat is salient, it's distracting, reduces your working memory capacity, and then your reduced working memory capacity reduces your performance on a test. Uh, does this make sense?
And this is a powerful concept, right? Because we often think when we've identified a mediator that we've sort of explained something, right? Like we already knew from a lot of research that stereotype threat effects uh, reduce, or stereotype threat reduces test performance. That when a stigma is made salient in some domain, you perform worse in that domain. But we now sort of feel like it's been explained, right? Like that we know the variable that's driving that effect. And that is, in this, in this research, working memory capacity. Other research suggests other intervening variables, and so this probably isn't the only reason why the salience of a negative stereotype in some domain will reduce your performance in that domain, but uh, it, is, it is one explanation and supported by good research. Questions about this? Okay, really, no questions. All right. Okay, so some larger conclusions based on this stereotype uh, lecture. So stereotypes can have many negative effects. Uh, more unfairly negative views and treatment of others, uh, stereotypes can lead to that. Also, uh, can lead to unfairly positive views. You may make positive stereotypic assumptions about people that don't apply to them, uh, that they don't deserve. Uh, also, stereotypes, when active, can impede individual achievement. So it's the case, this the stereotype threat component of the lecture, it's the case that stereotype threat can affect your social perceptions, your perceptions of other people, their perceptions of you, but they can even affect the way in which you perform, even when no one's really around. You know, when you're in a testing situation and you're, you're pretty much dialed in, just you and your test, stereotypes, which we think of as a social phenomenon, can still invade and, and have negative effects in this domain. Uh, we also found that intergroup contact can reduce stereotyping. Um, yeah, which we found an example of in the police officer's dilemma, and lots of research has supported this since it was first proposed in 1954 by Gordon Alford in his book, The Nature of Prejudice. Intergroup contact, interacting with other groups of people for which you have some kind of stereotypic association can undermine those stereotypes. Why? Because you develop a more nuanced and complex view of the members of that group. Yes, sir. Uh, the research suggests that intergroup contact reduces all stereotyping, both automatic and conscious, uh, uh, because you don't rely so much on simple generalizations, you have more nuanced information, um, but it doesn't destroy them either. We definitely have not found any interventions that lead you to stop using mental shortcuts in your everyday social perception. Right, no, I remember the question. The same, the issue you brought up at the last lecture, right? Yeah, yeah but remember that, the, you know, when they actually went to directly test the, you know, the effect of intergroup contact, they did find support for it. We just kind of are having a hard time reconciling with this other study that shows that African Americans as well as whites exhibit the police officer's dilemma effect. Um, it's still the case that there's a, an abundant amount of research supporting the intergroup contact hypothesis, as they call it. And remember also that Gordon Alford has a dirt fetish, so that's another reason to take all of what he says seriously. Um, another big finding from stereotype threat research is that even group, or sorry, from just stereotype uh, research, is that even groups victimized by negative stereotypes uh, often carry the benefits as well, uh, and or sorry, the the beliefs as well. The benefits they don't carry the benefits; <laughs> they they carry the beliefs as well. And this would be supported by uh, the Kenneth and Mamie Clark doll experiments, right, or the replication in that, uh, that YouTube film, A Girl Like Me, which I, which I hope you've all uh, taken some time to check out because it's, it's truly an amazing film. Uh, this woman replicated the Clark doll experiments a few years ago and essentially found the same findings that Clark's did 50 years ago. Uh, and so this, this is uh, one of the most, uh, well, this is something that I brought up in the status lecture about how status beliefs are endorsed or carried by both the advantaged and disadvantaged people uh, affected by them or, or uh, that are described by status beliefs, but it's also the case for stereotypes. Stereotypes are essentially more complex status beliefs. Uh, nuanced, or not, not insufficiently nuanced, but uh, relatively complex generalizations that you make about groups of people. And this is one last point I want to underscore is that remember that stereotypes are different from status in that status is pretty much all about assumptions you make about the competence of groups of people, whereas stereotypes are about more characteristics than just that. Um, okay, so we're gonna take a break here for a couple minutes and I can try and get my composure back. Uh, but I, I wanted to present the assignment that's due next week. Um, and this assignment is an unusual assignment, possibly the most unusual assignment you have ever done in school. Uh, 
And that's saying a lot considering you just did the breaching assignment like a month ago. Um, but this assignment is, is totally unusual and I hesitated to even assign it. Um, every semester I kind of size up the class and sort of say, all right, is, what, you know, can we do this assignment? And this is an assignment that's brought up in the James, uh, or sorry, in the Timothy Wilson book when he's talking about Jamie Pennebaker's research on the effects of introspection on mental health outcomes. And one of the things that they find there is that introspection, directed introspection about certain kinds of issues can have some positive mental health outcomes. And we're gonna review those when we get to that part of the class. The immune neglect lecture is gonna talk about this essay assignment and what its purpose is and what sort of effects you can expect to find from it. But in order to give you a sort of up close, personal, in-depth view of how introspection and mental health outcomes are related, I'm gonna have you actually do the assignment which has been studied uh, a great deal in past research. Uh, because it's introspective and very personal uh, assignment, there is an alternate assignment which you, you can opt for, which is, I think, equally easy or, you know, or it's about, about the same difficulty um, uh, and, you, you know, and you're free to do that instead. So uh, this assignment is both easy and hard. It's easy in the sense that you just have to write, what is it, uh, two single space pages and then you turn it in and we tear off the cover page and grade just whether you turned it in. If you turn it in, you get full credit. If you don't, then you get less than full credit. You get no credit. Um, <laughs> that's right. There's no degrees of credit on this. We, mostly, we just want you to do it and take it seriously. That's all we ask. We also promise that someone will read what you write. They won't know who you are, but they'll read what you write. Um, so whatever you write will go read by some other human being, uh, which, which may or may not be important to you but uh, they won't know who you are, so you can feel free to, uh, to be forthcoming. So here's the prompt. Here's the prompt for this. Uh, for this assignment, I would like you to write about your very deepest thoughts and feelings about an extremely important emotional issue that has affected you in your life. In your writing, I'd like you to really let go and explore your very deepest emotions and thoughts. You might tie your topic to your relationships with others, including parents, lovers, friends, or relatives, to your past, your present, or your future, or to what you have been, who you would like to be, or who you are now. So this is the essay prompt that you're supposed to respond to. Here's the format of your response. Again, this is a classic assignment that's discussed in the Wilson book. Please take it seriously. Uh, please turn in two single space type pages next Tuesday in class. Do a page, uh, one of those pages, in each of two sessions, okay? So do, this is the ideal way to do it. I can't monitor whether you do this, but this is the way we ask you to do it, is have one writing session where you write the first page, identify the thing you're gonna write about, and then follow the prompt and write for one single space page. Put it aside for at least a few hours, come back, and then write another page, and just sort of revisit the way you think about this, maybe re-explain your take on it uh, in, a, in the second single space page. Then, take a cover page, put it on top of that, put your name uh, on the cover page, and then when you turn it in next Tuesday, we will go through, we'll actually do it up here somewhere, maybe there or there, and we'll go through every, every one of these assignments that gets turned in and tear off the cover page, put the cover pages in a stack, and then the, uh, the essays in another stack, and then we'll have, we'll just grade whether you turned it in, just do we have a cover page on you, and then somebody will read all the essays, but they won't know you know, whose is whose. That way, you know, it's important to protect your anonymity on this because you might be talking about very personal stuff. So in that way we will, and you'll be able to see us, tear off the cover page up here so that you know uh, we're not sneakily looking into your diary uh, to find cool secrets about you, like your big sister or something. Um, I mean, in a lot of other ways we're like your big sister, but not in this one way. Okay, all right. Um, so we're only gonna grade if you turned it in uh, and your essay will be read, they just won't know who you are. Uh, are there questions about this? And I'll tell you the alternate assignment in one second. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, for, uh, should it be in like formal five paragraph essay style? Absolutely not. Do it, do it however you want. Uh, any format is acceptable. Whatever actually is the format that, you know, it comes out of, you know, your mind and is, is acceptable. Uh, one thing that we find with this assignment is maybe the first time you go to like, spill your guts on some issue, on this issue that you identify, you know, in your life. Uh, it might be not so coherent, it might not be complete sentences, you know, uh, but maybe over time you'll find you're writing some like pristine five paragraph essay by like the second uh, writing session, or maybe not. But uh, uh, that's one thing is don't get hung up on the, on, you know, on format. Just uh, get hung up on content and what you're talking about. Yes, sir. Is 
No, no. Is, the re is this assignment related to research? It is not. There's no one, no one will do any research on, on your, the contents of your essay. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. Glad you asked that. Uh, no, it's purely like a didactic exercise to get you uh, to really take home the point uh, from the immune neglect lecture and from this section of the Wilson book. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yes? Uh, so the question is, I don't understand the uh, two sessions, one page and two sessions thing. I guess what I would like you to do is sort of identify the thing you're going to write about based on the prompt. Write one page or more, if necessary, to finish expressing yourself on this point or whatever. Um, and then come back and just kind of start over. You don't have to retell everything or something, but just rediscuss or explain your take on this thing that you've identified to talk about. Um, you know, with somewhat new eyes a few hours later or two days later or something like that. Um, so it, to some extent, it's, you're free to interpret that exact, you know, however you like, you know. You could either continue your story or you could start from the beginning or you could just try to understand or examine the thing you're talking about differently and so on. Uh, just, I'm looking for two sessions. That's the main thing I want is for you to sit down at two different times. No way I can check and see if you're doing that. Nothing I can do. Nothing I can do. But I trust you. Trust all of you. And in the past, I haven't done this. I will also participate in this assignment as well. So I will do this too uh, because I'm interested and I never did it and I should have done it probably to begin with. It's such a strange assignment to ask all of you to do. So I will participate and throw my own essay into the pile. And I don't know. That's, that's, I'm excited. I'm with you. I'm with you. It's going to be great. We're all together. Okay. Deep inside our own heads. <laughs> We're all together. Okay. So. Uh, the alternate assignment, if you're for any reason uncomfortable doing that assignment, uh, then feel free to do this alternate assignment, which would also be due next Tuesday. And that would be Read Habits of the Heart, Chapter 1, uh, which is a book that was written by several Berkeley sociologists and, and a few people that weren't Berkeley sociologists, but it was written by Bob Bella and Ann Swidler. Anybody taking a class from Ann Swidler? Right? What's up? <laughs> so. Ann and Bob and a handful of other people wrote this book, Habits of the Heart. It's a very, very interesting book. Very. Very, very cool book, I think. Uh, I put chapter one on B space in the optional readings, and you would read it and then write a two page single space response, identify which of the four characters is most like you and explain why, identify which of the four characters is least like you and explain why. That's a only mildly introspective essay exercise. So if you're uncomfortable with the first one, do this one, and hopefully you'll learn a lot about yourself that way. Okay. So now we'll take a brief break, like two or three minutes, and then we'll start with the automaticity lecture. So we've now wrapped up the, you know, the kind of the social mountain in the middle of this class where, where things are very, very social, very interactional, and we're talking a lot about status and roles and identity and stereotypes. And uh, stereotypes are a really nice segue because we think of stereotypes as largely an automatic non-conscious process. I mean, if you knew that you were judging somebody inaccurately based on generalizations that you just received from the media, I mean, you wouldn't do it, right? You wouldn't do it. You'd be like, oh, I, that, these, these generalizations may or may not apply in this situation. But those generalizations are automatic, and so they happen, and they affect your perception of people outside of your awareness. And this is why I say it's a nice segue, because we can go now from this social part of the class to the more psychological part of the class, or back to the more psychological individual level of analysis in this class. And so now we're going to segue from stereotypes, which immediately makes us attuned to the role of automatic non-conscious processes in the course of social perception. Uh, we're going to segue from that to automaticity. And automaticity is a research area that is specifically concerned with the dynamics of non-conscious automatic thinking, uh, and is in particular oriented towards making the case that much more of your thought processes goes on outside of awareness and automatically and non-consciously than you perhaps realize. And that your conscious control part of your mind, the part of your mind that you have access to, uh, consciousness, is, is a smaller story in everyday life uh, than you would think. And what metaphor does Jonathan Haidt use to describe this, this duality, this dichotomy? The elephant rider metaphor, right? And he says that we're all sort of like uh, people trying to direct an elephant, which is enormous, is doing most of the work, kind of has its own mind about what it wants to do, and then we're at the top kind of vaguely steering it. And we think we're in control, 
uh, we're a little bit aware that we're not totally in control, but we think we're in more control than probably we really are. And we imagine we're doing a lot of work when really the elephant is doing all this work. Uh, who here is a big Kraftwerk fan? Big Kraftwerk fan? Awesome, awesome. Okay, well, this should be a good moment for the three of you. Uh, you've actually seen a Kraftwerk quote in a, in a college lecture. So, okay. Um, okay, so, I know. So now we've got to go back and we've got to mess with Rene Descartes one more time. Just one more time, just because it's fun and he has terrible hair. So, uh, so Rene Descartes proposed what has become the dominant view of human nature during the Enlightenment. He proposed this view that thinking is essentially a deliberate conscious process. He had a lot of other stuff that he thought about human reasoning and thinking, like that it was rational, logical, and so on. But right now we're going to focus most of all on uh, thinking as a deliberate conscious process. He had this portrayal. He said, uh, you know, he had this whole I think therefore I am kind of thing, which is based on the assumption that he can accurately perceive his thinking, right? He says, I think, I can see myself thinking, essentially, and therefore I know I exist. But what if he's wrong? What if he can't really see himself thinking? Or what if his insight on his mental processes is but like a fogged, opaque window uh, into his real mental processes? Well, Rene Descartes, uh, when not combing his beautiful flowing locks, uh, <laughs> espoused a perspective on human thought that is that behavior is a product of conscious reasoning and that we're in control of our behaviors. And this has now become an intuitive way to think about human thought and behavior. But I would argue that if we were to go back, say, 500 years to before the Enlightenment, people didn't think that way. You know, they didn't think that way. They thought uh, that maybe divine powers directed their behaviors. Uh, that's what you know, ancient Greeks thought, uh, people in medieval times. They, they, didn't have, they weren't so hung up on this idea that they're in conscious control of their behaviors. And so to a certain extent, this perspective that Conscious control processes are the way we run our behavior and our thought is a cultural construction and, and a Western cultural construction that you could trace to the Enlightenment. Um, so, yeah, Descartes would also say we're aware of the causes of our actions. Uh, this is a, a perspective that's assumed by Descartes, philosophy in general, most of social science, and I would argue most lay people in Western societies. So what, what if this view is wrong is kind of the point of this lecture and to some extent the rest of the class. And it's really maybe the central point of the Jonathan Haidt book and the Timothy Wilson book is what if, what if that view is entirely wrong? What if much of behavior is instead created by factors which are outside of our awareness, which we have only a sort of vague insight on? And what if we only think that we're in control? Have you ever heard this presented in like a philosophy class, by the way? This perspective that maybe you're just like a brain in a jar and you know, a mad scientist or some other power is sort of simulating the world around you and you're not really in control of everything. It's essentially the same idea as in the matrix, right? That you're in the matrix and uh, you're in some kind of gross, oozy thing or whatever in a pod and the, the machines are like running your consciousness, simulating some world where you think you're in control, but you're not. And you can't ever know that because you can't ever get outside your consciousness, but if you could, you'd then know, well, you'd be like Keanu Reeves uh, and then you would know uh, that you're actually a brain in a jar, essentially. Um, so what if we don't know the reasons for most of our behavior is uh, where we start. And this is the central idea of the Wilson book, which is just a, a kick-ass book. I, you gotta, you got to read this book really closely because it's, it's terrific. And Timothy Wilson is maybe, uh, you know, maybe my favorite social psychologist. So Wilson kind of cut his teeth coming up through the ranks, working with this guy, Richard Nisbet, at, you got it, Stanford University, yeah, I know, I know, right, in the 70s, and uh, there's nothing wrong with the 70s, uh, and they had a central thesis that they put forward in a review article uh, that was published in 1977 that to this day is one of the, the best works of social psychology. It's a review article, and what they wanted to do was review research that all kind of converged on the suggestion, the, the big insight, that we have limited access to our mental processes. We have limited insight on the causes of our behavior. And what they called the paper was telling more than we can know, uh, which is a title that sort of sums up this idea that if you ask somebody, you know, why would you do that or what are the causes of your behavior, they're just not necessarily going to know the right answer. And their article was reacting to the common sense assumption that many of us make that you can just ask people why they behaved in some way uh, that they did, and then you can trust what you hear back from them. 
that what they're going to tell you corresponds in some meaningful, uh, perhaps even totally accurate way, with the real causes of their behavior. In other words, they were reacting to this idea that you can rely on self-reports to understand people. And this is an assumption that's common in interview methods. A lot of people use interview uh, empirical research methods. Assume you just go up to people and say, you know, hey, why did, you know, why did you participate in that revolution? And they'll tell you, oh, this is why. And what they'll tell you is exactly right. Or, oh, hey, you know, why, uh, why do you abuse your wife? And they'll tell you exactly why. And so on. It's also something, an assumption that's made in focus groups research, where they say, oh, you know, why do you like that political candidate versus that one? You know that thing that they show on CNN with the dial, where like a handful of people that are picked as far as I can tell, just randomly, uh, then turn a dial when they like the person, turn it down when they don't. And the assumption there is that the dial, right, the dial, which then charts, you know, how much people like what Barack Obama's saying or, or, or like what John McCain's saying or what have you, whoever's debating, there is an assumption that that dial has some correspondence with voting behavior. Mind you, that assumption has never been tested and is perhaps very questionable based on, uh, based on research. But this assumption that self-reports are reliable insights on the causes of behavior uh, is also made in surveys and experiments all the time. And that was kind of Nisbet Wilson's position was, you guys, you, you have these fancy experiments and you're going to great, great lengths to conduct really, really rigorous research, but then at the end, you're just asking people, you know, why did you do this? You know, and you're often trusting what they say. And what a silly idea that is. Uh, oh, also media research, focus groups, surveys, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So, Nisbet and Wilson reviewed a huge literature from social psychology uh, which showed that people have little insight into the causes of their behavior. Uh, and what they found was, this is, and this is worse really, is that people won't even tell you when they don't know, right? If you ask people about the causes of their behavior, why'd you do this, they're always going to tell you something, right? Because people don't want their behavior to come from, you know, randomness or non-conscious factors. They want to imagine they're in control. We all want to imagine we're in control. And so we always think we have some reason for our behaviors. The problem is, most of the time, we seem to be just kind of coming up with it after the fact upon being asked. Um, and it doesn't actually correspond with the real causes. And so usually people will generate explanations. Um, they will have little correspondence with the real causes of their behavior. And what's more, those explanations of their behavior tend to sound very rational, and, you know, defensible and, and sensible. You know, like, oh, yeah, I did this horrible thing, you know, but I had these very good reasons for it. Yeah, right. So they're often, even usually, the wrong reasons for their behavior. So, and you should remember this. The next time you're in an argument with somebody about something they did, and you're like, why did you do that? Why did you do that? And they're giving you these explanations. Remember that they're just coming up with them on the spot. You know, like, <laughs> those are not the real causes of their behavior, most likely. Um, and they maybe don't even know what they are. This is something that happens all the time in like romantic relationships, right? They're like, why did you do that? You know, why did you do that? Was it to hurt my feelings? It was to hurt my feelings, wasn't it? I can tell it was to hurt my feelings, right? And then it's like, no, of course I didn't do it to hurt your feelings. I did it for this reason. It's like, you just made that up. I can tell you just made that up. You did it to hurt my feelings. Like, they don't know. That's the thing is they don't know. They don't know. And really all you're doing is sort of evaluating alibis, you know? Like, can you come up with an acceptable, sensitively phrased alibi? Um, which I guess matters, but uh, you know, you should keep in mind that's what you're doing. Okay, so people have limited insight into the true causes of their behavior, and if you want to understand human behavior, you can't just ask somebody. So now you're probably wondering what, what, what kind of research is a testimony to this, to this proposition? They have this big finding, I'm telling you there's this big review article, well what kind of research do they review in this review article? Well, one of my favorite pieces of research they review in this review article is the following. Um, it's just one example of, of how they marshal evidence in support of this claim that people don't have great insight on the causes of their behavior. And in this one experiment, I don't remember where it was conducted. We'll assume it wasn't, you know, that place. But uh, the subjects in this study were asked to tie two ropes together that were hanging from the ceiling in the lab. And uh, so one of them's hanging here and has like a tennis ball at the bottom, and the other one's hanging here and has a tennis ball at the bottom, and they're asked, tie these two together. And it's actually sort of a difficult task because what usually happens is the subjects go in there, they grab this one, and they go over to grab the other one, and it's just barely too far for them to tie them both together. They just can't quite grab it. And so uh, a lot of people fail this task. Uh, they don't, I know that sounds funny that, they're, that they can't tie two ropes together, but many people fail this task we would maybe fail this test. Do you understand what I'm saying here? Grab this, and you're supposed to tie it to this one, but you can't quite reach it. So the answer, does anybody know what the answer to this task would be? I didn't, I heard, thought I heard somebody say vegetarian. 
just be a vegetarian. That'll solve it all. <laughs> Nobody probably said that. What'd you, what? Yes, exactly. Swing the ropes, or swing at least one rope. Yes, exactly. So that's the answer, is if you get this rope swinging, then you can go over and grab this one, and then grab this one on an upswing, and then tie them together, and it's pretty easy. Uh, but uh, it's not exactly obvious. I mean, all of you know that because you, you know, you're very, very smart people, but uh, uh, for some reason the subjects in the study weren't as smart as you. So the, uh, they had two conditions to the study. In one condition, they just do it this way, right, where they just say, tie these two ropes together, figure it out, good luck, see ya. And, uh, and then they videotape, how long does it take them to figure it out? In another condition, they say, tie this rope to this rope, and then they bat it, sort of hit it, you know, and get it swinging. Just like tie a rope to this rope and hit it. They, they hit it. And, uh, and then in that condition, when they leave, the people figure out the task much faster. Okay? So they, uh, they, they figure out that you need to hit this one uh, and then tie the two together uh, in order to solve the task. They figure it out like in you know, half the time or something. But then when they ask them later, how did you figure out, you know, how to do this? Uh, people report, uh, don't, nobody reports because you batted the ball, and then I saw that that was the answer. Instead, people came up with incredibly fanciful explanations. Uh, so one person, well, a lot of them just said, I'm a very, very smart person, and uh, I figure stuff out like this all the time. So, uh, but some people, they even had a psychologist participate in this study because they were interested, do psychologists maybe have some greater insight into the causes of their behavior? And the psychologist had this whole extended Freudian explanation for how he figured it out. He was like, the vision came to me all at once. I saw monkeys swinging through the trees <laughs> on vines. And I imagined myself, a young Tarzan, flying through the jungle. Uh, and it came to me in that instant that I should grab the vine. And I knew it, you know, just then. from the monkeys or something like that. So you have this, this absurdly detailed uh, explanation when, when the, the experimenters know that odds are the reason he figured it out was he was in the condition where they batted it and like twice as many people get it right in that condition. So it's a classic insight on psychologists, but also on how we don't have uh, perfect, ac Freudian psychologists, but also on how we don't have perfect access uh, to the causes of our behavior. And ironically, Freud was one of the first proponents of this. Uh, to briefly discuss this idea that we have limited access to, our con to our, uh, the causes of our behavior, uh, that we're wrong in thinking our consciousness kind of runs the show. Originally in psychology, the, uh, there were kind of two strains on, on how you would do research. One was the Freudian strain. This is the late 19th century, early 20th century. And the Freudian st strain said deep, deep introspection that's carefully analyzed by a very smart psychotherapist will lead, will reveal the causes of your behavior. And, but the thing is, you can't take anything somebody says at face value because, in fact, behaviors are directed by unconscious causes, you know? And Freud is believed in some ways to invent the concept of the unconscious. Now, in fact, people knew about the unconscious before that, but in a lot of ways in academia, he sort of brought this concept to the fore. Uh, but there was a, another line of research, which we don't talk about very much, that was common in the 1890s called introspection research, where, again, you would ask people to introspect, sit in a very comfortable chair, and introspect. I'm not even joking about that. They had this whole thing about the science of comfy chairs, and they were like, it has to be a very comfy chair, very comfy chair. And this guy, Titchener, at Cornell University used to do this research, and in that research, they would just take whatever you said at face value. They didn't do some kind of deep analysis of, well, what do they really mean, you know? And when they say pillows, that's obviously breasts or whatever, you know? They didn't do this. They, instead, they said, oh, you, you say this causes your behavior. Okay, all right, I'm going to just take it at face value. So then the behaviorists come along in the early 20th century, led by like John Watson, B.F. Skinner, and so on, and they said, uh, this is rubbish. You guys are all just asking people what caused their behavior. Uh, some of you are Freudians, and you're like trying to analyze through the cracks of what they said, and you're inventing these weird theories about mother fetishes and so on. And then, and, uh, then the other group of you are just asking people what caused their behavior, and then you just take that at face value. That's not scientific at all. We're going to just eschew all self-reports. We're going to completely ignore self-reports and only study behavior. And we won't even think of people as having internal mental states or consciousness. We're just going to, we don't know how to study that. We have no access. We can't go in and take a picture of your thoughts. So we're just going to look at your behavior and analyze your behavior. And behaviorism, because it, partly because it was in reaction to some kind of crappy research, lived and, and thrived and dominated psychology for some 40 years. But then there's this rise, especially of social psychology, um, but also some other theoretical strains that came along and rejected behaviorism and said behaviorism is too narrow, it's too simple, its theory of human behavior uh, is based on you know, like three propositions, it doesn't cover the breadth, uh, richness, and diversity of human behavior, and we just need more, a more complex approach. 
and then gradually, gradually, we got the rise of the belief in the unconscious to come back in psychology uh, until we get to automaticity in the 90s, which goes, uh, goes nuts with this idea, basically, like takes it to uh, a greater extreme than it had been taken ever uh, since, since Freud, at least. Okay, so we're talking about how people have limited awareness of the causes of their own behavior. So this brings us, I think, to the thin slices literature. Who's familiar with the thin slices literature? The thin slices research. Okay, cool, because this stuff is cool. Okay, so thin slices research uh, is associated with a variety of scholars, but includes uh, one of the scholars is Sam Gosling, a UC Berkeley psychology graduate who wrote a book recently called Snoop. Anybody familiar with this book, Snoop? Yeah, so it's, it's a pretty cool book. It's a, we'll, we'll talk about the central idea of that in a second. The thin slices literature essentially asks, just how unaware are we? Um, is it possible that other people know us maybe better than we know ourselves? Which is a strange idea, right? A strange insight. Uh, because we start with this assumption that we have some kind of conscious control processes that are running things, that we have introspective abilities that allow us to know the causes of our behavior and know roughly who we are. But the thin slices literature says, wait, maybe other people uh, actually see us pretty darn well uh, based on very little information, less than we have, and maybe they even see us better than we see ourselves. So the answer, of course, thin, thin slices literature perhaps exaggerates this conclusion, and so we should make more measured conclusions. I'll talk about that in a second. So here's the basic thin slices experimental paradigm. People, when it, and it shows that people are surprisingly good at perceiving other people's personality characteristics with even just thin slices of behavior. So one example uh, of a thin slices study, the basic logic of thin slices studies, they give you some thin slice of behavior and then ask you to guess the characteristics of the person whose behavior you're observing, and then they find that those guesses are actually pretty accurate perceptions. So for example, they showed uh, in a recent study, they showed that people could predict the end of the year teaching evaluations that teachers got from just a 30 second silent clip of them. So if I show you a 30 second silent clip of a professor lecturing, you can predict with non-zero accuracy what kind of teaching evaluations they're gonna get four months later at the end of their semester. And they were like, wow, this is kind of amazing that we can do this. Just on 30 second silent video clips, you can't even hear what they're saying. You can't even hear if they can like complete their sentences, you know? But you, you can still guess pretty accurately what kind of evaluation they're gonna get. Uh, so then they were like, well wait, what about like maybe 15 seconds? Let's crank it down. And even with just a 15 second uh, video thin slice of someone behaving, you can predict where, uh, you know, what kind of evaluations their own, their own students will make some four months later. Uh, and then they cranked it down to just six seconds, and they were still able to uh, predict the end of the year teaching evaluation. So, so what do you think about this? Any questions about this? This is, this is a strange finding. Yeah. How do they predict what part of the lecture they would show? Like, what if the teacher just took a Right. Well, with the bad teachers, they just took a bad part. With the good teachers, they could, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so, because um, that would create the result, right? If they took like bad, you know, bad clips from bad teachers where they were obviously messing up or something, and then good clips from good teachers. Uh, I think they did it pretty randomly. I don't know. I think they were, I, knowing psychology, they probably had to do it really randomly, but I don't, I don't remember the methods section of the paper. Yeah. I think that they filled out the exact same dimensions that uh, the course evaluations, uh, you know, the same dimensions that were used on the actual end of year course evaluations and showed, you know, a significant correlation. Not a really high correlation between the evaluation, the guest evaluations and the real evaluations, but like pretty high, you know, not bad. So I would say, yeah, 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 what you got? Yeah. Nice, nice. Okay, I'll answer that question next. I was hoping someone would, would figure that out. Okay. So, uh, okay, we'll come back to that. So I would say that there's two reasons why these thin slices are pretty darn accurate. So one is that you get a surprisingly large amount of information on somebody based on a thin slice. So one of them is that you can actually make relatively accurate judgments about people with just a little bit of exposure to them. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. You can see a lot about somebody's personality in the way they behave and express themselves, like extroverts use their hands a lot when they talk. Uh, you know, shy introverts tend not to talk as much, uh, you know, and so on. Uh, but also, demographic characteristics, right? Like, to a certain extent, stereotypes that are based on demographic characteristics have some factual content, perhaps because of self-fulfilling prophecies, they actually direct people's behavior, or they're just generalizations that have some factual content. They're not totally true, but they have something there. Um, and so, 
if you, you can see somebody's kind of basic demographic characteristics on a, on a thin slice, right? You can see their age, race, gender, s stuff like that. Uh, that's about it, but you can get those things. Um, you can get other insights on their personality, like how do they dress? That gives you some kind of insight on people's personality. Past research has shown that. So that's one answer on why these thin slices uh, provide you enough information to estimate uh, end of year teaching evaluations. Um, a second thing is not based on the accuracy. It's actually based on inaccuracy. It's that in a thin slice, you get all this stereotypic information, uh, which may or may not be that accurate, but which people who actually take the class and take the class all the way through the four months and then get to the end and do the teacher evaluations, they're still relying on those initial stereotypes, right? They're still thinking about the person's age, gender, race, and so on when they make the evaluations. So whether those things are actually accurate in describing the real characteristics of the teacher, it's nonetheless the case that people continue to rely on them. And you get them in the first six seconds. So that portion of information on how people rate people is available to you right away. So there's at least kind of two ways in which the thin slices effect works, if not more. One, thin slices actually do give you a lot of information. But also, thin slices give you information which you'll continue to rely on for four months, whether you should or not. And I'll, fit, I'll continue with the thin slices thing and then return uh, to your point about how does this reconcile with the fundamental attribution error. Okay. Also, they found with thin slices that you can watch a short videotape uh, of somebody and then predict how generously they'll behave towards somebody else in a subsequent interaction. That's a pretty impressive result. Also, they've shown that you can uh, predict somebody's IQ reasonably well from a 10-second silent video clip um, you know, with some level of accuracy. And let's see here. Right, oh, okay. And then this is an idea that's our own Sam Gosling, a Berkeley graduate, uh, extended in a paper called Room with a Q, uh, a cute title, and then also a book called Snoop. And in that, what he did, he documents some research where he shows people photographs of dorm rooms right, and bedrooms and says, hey, try and guess this person's personality characteristics. And people were able to estimate their actual personality characteristics pretty well from just looking at a picture of their dorm room. Uh, you know, not one where they're allowed to like clean up first or anything like that, like an actual just snapshot of everyday life in their dorm room. Um, and and that, that was the room of the Q research. And then he extends this in Snoop where he says, how can you kind of figure out people's personalities from their offices, their, their homes, uh, the things they own, and so on. And there's certain things that do cue, infor cue personal information really well, and there's certain things that, that don't cue it as well. Okay. And, Perhaps one of the weirdest findings from this thin slices literature is that in some cases, like for some characteristics, extroversion and IQ are examples, people can rate targets uh, with just a thin slice, like a 10, 15 second silent videotape, they can rate the targets more accurately than the targets can themselves, which is totally weird. Okay, so for an accurate evaluation of like how extroverted you are in terms of like how you know bubbly, vivacious you are in social settings, you uh, somebody else watching you can estimate that a little bit better than you can, and then IQ likewise, that and which creates this bizarre thing that you could live inside your own skin for 20 years or 30 years and have no greater insight on your IQ than someone who watches a 10-second silent videotape of you. Totally bizarre insight. Now. There's some specific reasons for the IQ result, right? Uh, and the extroversion result is that there's social desirability issues, right? Like you want to believe your IQ is as high as is plausible for you to believe it to be. Uh, motivated reasoning, right? The above average effect and so on. So we know there's some specific biases in some of these domains where you want to be higher, you want to be more valued uh, on those characteristics. And as a result, you maybe systematically overestimate, whereas an observer wouldn't do that. But nonetheless, it's still bizarre. 10 second silent videotape, they don't even know what you're saying. How can they guess? your intelligence at a non-zero level, but they can. Okay, so this brings up a question, which is how does all this reconcile with the fundamental attribution error? How can it be the case that for certain dimensions, we don't know ourselves as well as other people know us based on even just a thin slice of our behavior? How can we reconcile that with the fundamental attribution error, which says that we do a terrible job in assessing the causes of other people's behaviors, but we actually are, do a reasonable good job, reasonably good job of assessing the causes of our own? And you remember the reason that I gave you for the fundamental attribution error was focalism, or your perspective. That when you go to assess the causes of other people's behaviors, what do you do? You see them, right? You see them behaving, and so you say, oh, they made that happen. But when you go to make the assessment, the attribution of the causes of your behavior, what you see is you, uh, uh, you oh, so you don't see yourself, you see your environment around you. And so it's easier for you to make an attribution to your situation or your environment. 
But I think that this thin slices literature maybe gives us even just a little bit more insight. I would say these, these findings can be reconciled a little bit. And I think that thin slices findings give us a little bit more insight on how the fundamental attribution error works. So one is Nisbet and Wilson 77, and this, these thin slices findings suggest we don't know ourselves that well. Maybe in a situation we could, accept, we could uh, assess the cause of some behavior pretty accurately because we can see the environment around us and we can't see ourselves, so we're sort of hampered for making that attributional bias. But in general, we don't know ourselves nearly as well as we believe we do or we might like to. So as we're, and to a large extent, when we go to understand other people, we rely on our understandings of ourselves, right? We say, oh, okay, I know how I think, how I behave, the causes of my behavior, and so I'm going to just sort of um, project that onto other people and assume that they think about the same way. So the fact that we have very poor insight on certain characteristics, extroversion IQ are examples, is part of the reason why we have poor insight on other people, um, because we just don't start with a good baseline from our own behavior. Um, but a, a second, what was the second one going to be? Uh, boy. Um, oh yeah, okay, a second reason uh, why these findings are reconcilable is, remember, the fundamental attribution error is in part about how we don't perceive others very accurately. And the thin slices literature isn't so much about how we perceive others really accurately as it is that we get a ton of the information we'll ever use in judging them in the first few seconds. That's kind of the finding. It's not the case that these correlations between perceptions of people's extroversion, IQ, or other characteristics are super duper accurate. They're not inaccurate, but they're not super accurate either. But what's most interesting, or the main finding from Thin Slices is that you're never going to have that much different or that much more nuanced or that much more accurate views of people with four months more of information than you had after 30 seconds. So one of the insights of the Thin Slices literature is you rely way, way, way too much in your perceptions of others on, on first impressions. Uh, so that's, that's why the two, I think, are reconcilable. Thin Slices literature is saying, among other things, First impressions are really sticky. You rely on them too much. You rely on them forever. But then also that, uh, and so that works pretty well with the fundamental attribution error, which says you don't perceive others that accurately. Well, you're probably not going to if you over rely on how they behaved in the first 30 seconds you knew them. Yeah. Oh, well, I was just going to ask how that reconciles with the the Ah, that's good. You guys are good. Yeah. Right. So doesn't this contradict the Alport 54 claim that uh, interacting with a member of, a, of another group will reduce your stereotyping of that other group? Um, yes, it does seem contradictory. I agree. Because um, that seems to be saying you do get more information from continuing to interact with people over time. Uh, I can think of at least two ways in which that's reconcilable. Like, one, uh, that... In the first 30 seconds of watching this teacher lecture, you're able to estimate most, uh, you know, highly, your, your estimate of how good a teacher are, they are is highly correlated with the rating you're going to get four months later. So it is the case that most or a huge chunk of the information you're going to rely on, you're getting in that first 30 seconds. But there is still more information that you do rely on. It's not a perfect correlation. So it is the case that as you get to know somebody, you do develop more, you know, vivid impressions of them. You do add information. Not as much as we would want you to, you know, but you do add information. So in that way, they are reconcilable, I think. But another way is that it could just be that um, as you interact with individual people from, from a group that you maybe made stereotypic assumptions about, you learn uh, about other groups that they're members of, other stereotypes that you would apply to them, and you're still laying stereotypes on them. You just lay more on them. And you sort of say, oh, Joe is the intersection of my stereotype of upper middle class, white people who went to this college, who have this background, who are this age. And it's not so much that you stop using stereotypes, you just use more 